All right, good morning and welcome. Um, my name is Ashley Bordelon. I'm the collections manager for the Brit Philicology Herbarium. Um, and this is our armchair botanist program um, where today we'll be going over the crowdsourcing platform on our torch portal. So basically we will be um, transcribing our Texas specimens um, from our Brit and SMU collection. Um, and this is all for our recent NSF grant to digitize these collections. So what is an armchair botanist? We define an armchair botanist as a botany enthused person varying from amateur to professional in background who participates in the collective study, conservation, and research through virtual ne networks. So anytime that you are helping us virtually with our specimens, you are participating um, in this, in the, our quest to help make these accessible. Um, and eventually these will be used by, um, by researchers or by just the general public. Um, so you are armchair botanists. And if you haven't been to our herbarium, um, here's a few pictures of what it looks like. Um, we basically preserve these specimens in these cabinets. We take care of them. Um, and we also make sure that they're accessible, like I said, for researchers, not just um, locally, but around the world. Um, we definitely get requests from folks. I just got an email yesterday from somebody um, in the UK wanting some more information about our collections by finding it through our portals. So it's really exciting that um, even though they're locked away in these cabinets, they're still accessible virtually. So I mentioned the NSF grant that we received to digitize not only our Texas specimens, but also our Oklahoma specimens as well. So within our herbarium, we have a few collections, Brit SMU, Vanderbilt, and we also have uh, the NLU collection from Louisiana. So across all of those collections, we have over 200,000 from Texas and Oklahoma. And NLU and the Vanderbilt V2B are basically done. Um, and what's remaining is um, around 18,000 left to transcribe from our Britain SMU collection. So if you've not seen a herbarium specimen before, we have an example on the left um, that just gives you an example of what you might find. Um, you'll obviously see the plant material. Um, you'll see some stamps around the sheet. This is from our SMU collection. Um, and you'll also see a primary label in pretty much the bottom right-hand corner, sometimes the left. Um, and then a few annotation labels might be on there as well. Um, and the label on the right, um, you'll see has a few different colored highlights. This is just showing you some of the information that's on this label. Um, thankfully, the specimens we'll be working with will have some of this information already transcribed, already on the record. Um, so what we'll go through is how to completely transcribe um, the specimen, filling in mostly the, the rest of the locality information and any habitat plant notes that might be on that label. Okay, so to get started with crowdsourcing, I'm just going to walk through the basic steps um, and then we'll actually get started going through some examples. Um, it's kind of the best way to get good at this is just seeing examples. Um, so if you haven't already, created a username in our torch portal. I would suggest just doing that now. That way it's easier to walk along with us. Um, you won't get any spam email or anything like that. Um, so you'll want to create a username and log in. And on the top bar, you'll see a button that says crowdsourcing. So we're gonna click into crowdsourcing. You'll come to a page that looks like this. Um, you don't have to worry about any of this information on the top of the screen, what you'll want to go to is the second table down here. You'll see those three collections that I mentioned in our herbarium. Um, and we're gonna be focusing on the Brit collection. So that first collection in that table, you'll select the open records for Brit. 
Um, this is basically meaning that these are the records that are available to transcribe that are in the queue um, for you to transcribe. When you click into the open records, you'll come to another table, looks a little bit like this, um, to open a record, and you can open any record in this table, you'll select the Symbiota ID in this first column on the left. Um, you can either select the number and that will open the record in the window that you're in. If you click the little arrow next to the number, it'll actually open up the record in a new window. So you can do either way, um, it'll still open that record. You'll notice from this table, um, like I briefly mentioned earlier, that some of this information has already been entered. This is what we call skeletally transcribed. So it just has the bare bones of the label data um, in these records. And this is really helpful um, if any of you have helped out with our other projects. Sometimes we needed specimens to be skeletally transcribed. Um, it's super quick. Um, and this way we're at least able to search for these specimens and know exactly where they're from. Um, but what you'll be helping out with is completely transcribing these specimens. So let's open a record by selecting the Symbiota ID. You'll come to the occurrence editor for the record. So you'll see the specimen image on the right hand side, and then we have all of our fields on the left hand side that we'll be entering in information. So you'll want to take a look at the specimen and look for the primary label on that sheet. Like I said, it's typically on the bottom right hand side. Um, it could be elsewhere, but you'll want to zoom in to that label. So first, you'll probably want to adjust the size of the picture depending on how big your screen is. Um, if you hover your arrow over the bottom right hand corner, you'll be able to expand the box that the image is in, make it bigger. And then there's two ways to zoom into the image. You can either hold the control key on your keyboard and click on the area of the image you'd like to zoom into. The second way to zoom in is to hold down the shift key. And as you hold down the shift key and click on the image, some crosshairs will come up. You can move your mouse forward to zoom in and move it backwards to zoom out. You may also notice if you're already in a record that um, they will automatically be in medium resolution. So the image on the left, it's it's legible, you can read it, um, but there might be some labels you come across that are handwritten and the, um, the typing is really faint. Um, so you may want to select high res and it'll make that image a little bit clearer However, it'll also take a little bit longer to load. So it's totally up to you if you want to keep all the images at high res. Um, just depends on your computer and um, how quickly these images are loading for you. OK, so we're zoomed into the image. Um, we have the label up. Um, the first step is to confirm that all of the information that has already been typed into those fields matches everything that's on the label. So like I said, we've had this effort of skeletal transcription back in maybe 2014, 2015. Um, so volunteers and staff have already done this for us, but it's possible that they may have missed information or mistyped. So just confirm that yes, the collector is correct, the number's correct, collection date, scientific name, we should all be in Texas, but make sure the country, state, and county all matches the label. So one of the things that may be different um, of all things would be the scientific name. So we grab that scientific name from the primary label. However, there could be other annotation labels around this primary label with a more recent date. Um, and in that instance, we'll want to update the scientific name if it differs from that primary label. And we'll have some examples as we get going. Next, once everything's confirmed, 
you'll start typing in the locality. That should be the first um, bit of information to fill in. So in the locality field, you'll grab that data from the label. For this example, it starts at near entrance to Blue Beaver Park, west of Lawton. And then the remaining information on here is clay loam. So this would be some habitat information. So we'll put that in the habitat field. You'll see some other fields that are empty, and that's okay. Um, depending on the label, we may or may not have that information. So you are free to leave any fields blank if there's nothing to put in them. Um, so for this example, we didn't have any plant description or any other notes. Um, this was it. And lastly, once you've completely transcribed that um, label, you'll set the status to pending review. This way, um, I know that I need to, myself or other staff needs to review it um, once you've complete that transcription. Um, and once you set your first record to pending review, every subsequent record afterwards will stay at pending review. So you'll only have to do this for the first record you do um, for that, for your session that day. And Lulu just asked, why is loam considered habitat and not sub substrate? So we've had some uh, staff and volunteers in the past uh, put this in substrate, and it's not technically wrong. Um, however, I at least prefer to put it in habitat. So if you ever click on that question mark next to any of the fields, um, you'll get a little bit more of a description of what it is. Um, but I consider substrate uh, more for our organisms like mosses and lichen and fungi. Um, that would be maybe, you know, what host plant has it, has it growing on it. Um, but also for substrate, um, if anything, I've used, if the label has any specific soil type, um, like a named soil series, like Catahoula formation is one example I've seen. Um, and we may see some other examples here, but for clay loam, sand, um, anything like that, we would put in habitat, not substrate. And it's okay if you end up putting it in substrate. Um, like I said, there's records that we have that have this information in there, um, but my preference is putting it in habitat. So we've set the status to pending review, and the last step is to click Save Edits. So if that Save Edits button is grayed out and not clickable, it means that you haven't changed anything. Um, you haven't updated in, any information in that label. So make sure that you've actually made changes, um, and then you'll be able to click Save Edits, and you'll get this success at the top of the screen. So this is your last chance on this page to review the record that you just transcribed um, before moving on to the next record. Once you click the next arrow button, uh, you won't be able to see this specimen anymore. Um, but it's okay, I'll be able to see it on my end. So if you really feel like you messed something up, um, I'll be able to see it and review it. Um, so it's not lost forever. Um, and I'll show you some more ways to flag these um, for me. Um, but you can either, like I said, click these next arrows, or if you had opened this in a new window, you can close the window and open up a new one from that main table. So if you're having trouble with a record, um, rather than setting the status to pending review, you can set it as expert required. Um, and you can leave some notes in brackets for me in the notes field. Um, so that way I can see that it's flagged as expert required and know that you had some issues with that, uh, whether, um, whether that be, you know, one field that you weren't sure about, or maybe the image is wonky and you can't even read the label, um, anything like that. And we'll also have, um, a question form that I'll show you in the Google folder for volunteers, or obviously you can email me directly for any um, questions that you have on a specimen. So speaking of, 
that Google folder. Let me share the link here. So in this Google folder, we'll have, like I said, that question form that you can fill out for specific records that you're having difficulty with. Um, we also have an office hours um, request form. If you ever want to have a one-on-one -on -one Zoom with me or any other staff about um, transcription or anything else, but you can also um, request to meet in person at the herbarium if you'd like to meet in person. Um, this will also be a folder where we'll eventually, like Lulu asked, put those um, written instructions, some FAQs that we have. And as we get this project going, um, I'm sure we'll come across some more questions that we hadn't thought to put in there before. So we'll we'll be constantly updating um, some of those FAQs and written instructions um, as the project goes. All right, those forms. Okay, so let's actually go through it together. So here's our Torch portal page. And not only is this where the crowdsourcing is, but if you ever just wanted to search our collections or other herbaria, you can use the search collections function. And this is just for your information. Um, so here's our Torch, um, our consortium of herbaria in Texas and Oklahoma, this list right here. And there's even a few more that aren't listed. And then beyond that, all over North America. Um, so you can either search for collections across all herbaria, or you can just choose, you know, the Brit collection if you'd want. But let's click into crowdsourcing. Okay, and we're gonna go down to the Brit collection and click on those open records. And we come to this table right here. And I am going to click a random record to transcribe. I'm opening it in a new window. OK, so here we are. And I think first things first, I'm going to make this box as big as I can. It's already in high res for me. And then I'm going to use the shift button, click on the image, and you can see those crosshairs pop up. I'm going to zoom in by moving forward. And if I needed to zoom out, I'm just moving my mouse backwards. Okay, so first things first, let's confirm that all of the information in here is correct. And so far, it's looking right to me. So you may notice that the scientific name here doesn't match the primary label. However, we have an annotation label later than the collection date, and he... Todd Stussy um, identified this specimen as a variety. So that's why we have that variety right here. And then we have Texas and the county live oak. So all of this information looks correct. So I'm gonna complete this transcription, starting with the locality. So beyond county, what locality is remaining? We have 11 miles south. Oh. <laughs> Not that, Miles, here we go. South of George West. And that looks to be all of the locality information here. The next field, since we don't have coordinates, we don't have elevation, we're gonna move on to habitat. Habitat would be roadside, gray silt and limestone gravel. I guess I've typed that out before. And then next we have description. So this is referring to any descriptive um, information about the plant itself. So the rays are white and disc, here we go. Okay, and that is all that's remaining. So this is all the information on the sheet. Um, we've had questions about verbatim date. So like I said, the skeletal information was previously um, done by staff and volunteers, but it wasn't actually done in this platform. It was done in an Excel spreadsheet and then uploaded. So this verbatim date will pretty much be exact to what the date says and not the actual verbatim date on the label. Um, you can choose to ignore this completely. 
Um, you can delete it if you want to. Um, I would say the only time you would want to maybe change the information in here is if maybe there's an ambiguous date. Um, some examples might be uh, even like the example in this presentation. Let me find it. Um, this one was 6402. And if you know that United States, we don't do our dates like everyone else in the world. Um, so this could potentially be interpreted as April 6th, uh, 2002, rather than June 4th, 2002. So this might be an example where I put this verbatim date in the verbatim date field, just in case um, someone wants to argue that uh, it actually wasn't April or it was, or it was April and not June, vice versa. Um, there might be some examples of you know, it might just say spring of a certain year. Um, that would be a good example to put in verbatim date as well. But for the most part, you should be able to just ignore this. Um, and then finally, let's set our status to pending review. And I will save my edits. I get that success at the top. And I can either go to the next record and you'll see that the number in the queue went down by one or I can exit out of that record and go back to the table. I'm going to click the first record just to show you if you ever come across this screen this just means that there's another volunteer that is currently working on that record. So it's being edited by another user that way this just ensures that no one's overwriting each other's work um, so if this ever happens, you can just go to the next record. Or again, go pick another one on the screen. And you'll notice that for the most part, everything in this queue is in the sunflower family. So I hope you enjoy your sunflowers. I'm going to click into this one. All right, this is lovely. Okay, I'm going to zoom into the label. And um, there's a few options up here. All of these images should and labels should appear upright, but if there's ever um, a label that's not rotated or that's rotated um, on the image, you can rotate this image if you need to, um, right or left. Um, you can also unanchor. So if you zoom down or if you click this little arrow right here, um, and you scroll up and down, the image will follow you, but you might not need to do that. Okay. So let's confirm that everything in here is matching. Looks to be so. Stonewall. Okay. So I'm going to start typing in the locality for this record, 8.4 miles. And you'll notice that I'm typing everything verbatim. Um, I may uh, use capital, capitalize the first letter of um, each field and then put a period at the end. And that may be a little bit different from the label. Um, but this ensures that one of these days, if this label on the specimen ever came off, we could reprint a label from our um, Torch platform, from this transcribed record. And right now you're noticing that there, is a drop down of locality streams. They all look identical and they all look identical to what's on my label. You're allowed to use this little shortcut and not type as much by selecting one of these fields. The only caveat is to make sure that any other information that carries across, um, it'll show up in a blue highlighted field. So it carried across the habitat. And lucky for me, this habitat does in fact match the habitat on my label as well. So any information that carries over, just make sure that it actually still matches um, what's on your label. It could be a little bit different. So again, that just saved me a little bit of extra typing. And the rest to type out is just the description of the plant. So raise red, except for narrow, orange, yellow, April zone. And it's interesting to see this as the description versus what the plant dried looks like. It just goes to show how important having this description is um, on our labels.
or collecting. Okay, I'm gonna click Save Edits and we're good to go. And I'm gonna go back to the table and try to find a collector with a little bit maybe more different information to give us some more good examples of what you guys might see. Hopefully find a more recently collected specimen. Here's in the early 2000s. Let's click this one. Um, I gave you the option to give a status of expert required if you have difficulty on a specimen. You're also more than welcome to just go to the next record. Um, if you hadn't even started transcribing, um, you can simply just go to the next record and skip it and leave it for someone else to figure out. Um, if you do select expert required and you save it and you move on to the next record, it will still have expert required on the status auto set. So just make sure if you do use expert required to change it back to pending review when you continue onwards. All right, so I'm gonna zoom into my label. This one has an interesting coordinate and I will, um, it's probably a good example, but we'll um, get into that. So I'm gonna start typing in what I see here. Um, we had a question yesterday about the uh, collector. Um, you may see variations of the collector in this field. So if you would, if you would really like to, you could add in that extra L. Um, however, this it, it, it is the same. It's referring to the same collector. So you may see Geo L. Fisher could be George L. Fisher in here, as long as they you can confirm that they are this the, at least the same collector. It's okay if there's some variation to the name. You don't necessarily have to correct or update that. We also had a question yesterday about the authorship that came after the scientific name. So we have a genus, Gailardia, we have Suavis, the specific epithet, and then we have this authorship. This is information that is kind of behind the scenes and that you don't have to worry about typing in yourself. Um, there's a button up here that says long form. If you click long form, it's going to expand and give you a whole bunch of other fields. Um, it's a little bit overwhelming. So we want to avoid having y'all having y'all have to open long form to put in any, any information. But this is just to show you that um, there is an author field and that when I start typing in a scientific name, um, it will automatically update. So I just removed the specific epithet, but I'm gonna move it back and you'll see that it automatically gave me the authorship and the family. So that's why you don't have to worry about those two bits of information um, recording that anywhere. There's also a common name on this label. This is something else that you can totally ignore. Um, it's possible that this specimen isn't actually the species. Someone may come along and identify it as something else. And then this common name may or may not be relevant anymore. Um, and it just varies. Common names are, you know, they vary by region. They could refer to more than one scientific name. Um, so it's nice to have on the label, but we don't necessarily need to record it in any of our fields. So I'm gonna start typing the label at Mason Mountain. All right, and here's another one where I'm getting a few different locality string options. And like I said, you can absolutely use these as long as they are matching what's on your label. Um, so it looks like this one right here, the second one looks to be mine. In the southeast corner of Dove Field, and then even the habitat information copied over correctly. So limestone bedrock, calcareous soil. The only thing that is not on here is this UTM and some numbers after that. This is referring, this is um, actually some coordinates. Um, so 
you may be used to uh, minutes, degrees, seconds north, same west. Um, this is just another way to um, have written uh, coordinates. Um, for the UTM, what I would prefer is just to have that in the locality field. So typing it like this would be just fine. This will help us get a decimal Latin long eventually when it's geo-referenced. So something like that. If you have any other coordinates, like I said, minutes, degrees, seconds, et cetera, there's a button right here, the little F button. If you select that button, you'll get these two yellow fields. So you can enter in the uh, minutes, degrees, seconds in here, insert lat long values, and they'll show up in verbatim coordinates and you'll get a decimal lat long. Um, so maybe we'll come across an example like that. But for the most part, a lot of these collections are older. Um, I think the boom in collecting is probably for our collection specifically um, is in maybe the 50s and 60s. Um, the mid 1900s really um, are where more, most of these things are, most of these specimens were collected. So you won't have to deal with too many coordinates. Looks to me like this is all complete. So I'm gonna save my edits. And let's look for, like I said, one of those other coordinate examples. I'm trying to think of folks who I know, some collectors that may have some of those on their labels. Can't remember, let's see a Tony Keeney specimen. All right, no coordinates, but let's just do this one since we're in here. Confirming all of this is correct. Mm -hmm. Let's start. Ha. Ah. So this is an interesting example. Um, kind of has habitat and locality information combined in one sentence. Um, the most important thing is that any locality information is in the locality field. When we eventually assign a latitude and longitude to these records um, through a different type of uh, platform called geolocate, um, we're only seeing the locality string. So we don't see anything that it may be in the habitat or description or notes. Um, so we want to make sure that anything relating to locality ends up in the locality field. I, for this one, I'm probably just going to put Frio River. Um, it doesn't specify where on, along the Frio River. Um, so I think I might just start with Frio River and put a semicolon northwest of Nipa on... And then for habitat, along the low wet areas of the river. So for habitat, I don't need to include the name of the river. I'm just putting river in rocky soil. And that's it. So this is kind of a good example of picking out information from just this one sentence um, to go in locality and habitat. I have another example of that in the PowerPoint. <gasps> no way, Susan, that's kind of crazy. You'll see probably a lot of his specimens in here. Let's look at this one together. Um, kind of a similar label, but a little bit different. Um, the sentence floodplain of West Verde Creek. Do you guys think that this sentence would be in the locality field or would it be in the habitat field? You can either put it in the chat or unmute yourself if you'd like. Habitat, yeah. Anyone else? It's a little bit of a trick question because it's both. 
So like I mentioned in that other example, um, we want to make sure that anything locality based is in the locality field. So West Verde Creek, that's a name of a creek and we can find that on a map. Um, so we do want to include that in locality. However, that's definitely some habitat information too. So you can actually repeat that information in the habitat field, um, but we don't necessarily need to include the name of that creek. So in this example, I did put floodplain of West Verde Creek in the locality field, but I also repeated that in the habitat field and just excluded the name of the creek. And then we have this example right here where there's some locality information in the header of this label. Um, you can absolutely use this in the locality field. In fact, it helps give it a little bit more context. So, you know, in southwest west portions of the park from Lower Bull Canyon T3, um, it's possible that we would have been able to figure out what park, you know, it's referring to. Um, Cause like I said, whenever we geo-reference these specimens, we only have the locality field. We won't be able to see the image of the specimen. We won't see anything else that's in these um, other fields. Um, so including this really helps us narrow down where the specimen was collected. So this is an example where you would use um, Copper Break State Park, you would actually put that in the locality field and either separate it with a period or a colon, something like that. Okay. I'm going to see any more, maybe a Roger Sanders collection. Uh, here's a long one. Here's another example. And this one, oh, these are fresh. These were uh, mounted in an interesting way. We had some original National Park labels. Um, and then here's some original labels here. But let's just obviously zoom into the one that we can completely see. For the most part, they are duplicate, duplicate information. Um, so it's okay that we can't see this behind it. All right, we've got Roger Sanders and the dates looking correct. Scientific name, country, state, county. Um, here's another example where there is some locality information in the header. So plants of the LBJ, LBJ National Historic Park. I'm gonna start by putting that information here. That way the rest of the body of the label makes a little bit more sense. Aha, and the, here's another example where it's already been typed out by somebody previously. So let's carry over that information and just confirm that it is matching what we have on ours. So yes, ranch unit, tween, all right. And then it includes some lat long right here. Um. It also carried over some coordinates. We could say that it's probably correct. Um, I'm a little, I get a little bit weary about always using coordinates from other records. They could have been automatically generated and not typed in by somebody. Um, so my preference would be uh, rather than keeping coordinates, you could um select one of these buttons and it'll show you where those coordinates are um what where those coordinates are so if i zoomed in it looks like you know we're in lbj national historic park um we could probably use these coordinates um if we wanted to just knowing that it is um matching with the locality string. It appears to be correct, but for sake of um, learning how to do this, I would select the F button. 
And these coordinates are not in, and doesn't have the latitude first and the longitude. Um, so it looks like the latitude is 30 degrees and only 15 minutes. There's no seconds. And then longitude 98 and 37. And whenever I click insert lat long, it'll give me that nice format um, that eventually auto automatically populates decimal lat and long. And if I click it again, it goes away for me. And the last remaining is some habitat information. And it doesn't look like this exactly matches what's on our label. So I'm gonna remove the habitat that copied over um, and here's an example. I I would say that um, we have a mode natural vegetation around historic building for description. We have rays and discs yellow, and then words like uncommon, common. Um, rare, abundant, occasional. These are all words that we consider um, notes or you know notes about the occurrence of this um, plant or its population where it was collected. Um, so that would go in the notes field. You'll see I also have some other things that I've typed in here before. There is this bit at the bottom collected by the Botanical Research Institute of Texas, blah, blah, blah. You're welcome to put that information in notes if you'd like. Um, so I've typed that out before, so I'm just going to copy it over here. Um, you're welcome to put that in here. You can also ignore it. Um, it's just a little bit of extra information. Um, I also noticed mode natural vegetation around historic building. It's possible that that could help me also narrow down locality. So this, the coordinates that we have, don't go down to seconds. So it's a little bit of a more broad area for the coordinates. Um, it does have coordinates, which is great, but I could choose to, if I wanted, um, include that information in, in the locality that I included in the habitat. Because who knows, maybe if I am looking at the map, maybe there's a historic building. It says, you know, along terrace, terraces along the river between Junction School and the LBJ birthplace. Um, but it's possible that there's a historic, you know, another building in there that narrows the, loca the location, the exact location down a little bit more. Um, so that may help to be in the locality information as well. And we're still in pending review. Save edits. And let's go back to our table. We have a little bit less than 15 minutes um, until the end of the hour. So if you guys have any burning questions, please um, feel free to um, unmute yourself or type any questions you may have in the chat. Um, as we wrap up a few more examples before we go. Um, I mean, like I said at the beginning, the best way to, you know, get good at this is to just um, keep practicing and uh, pulling information from the label, see where, how it's formatted, because um, every label is going to be different. This is a Eula White House specimen. Let's zoom into the label. I'm confirming all this is correct. And I'm going to get started typing. Lucky me. I can copy over information. And this habitat doesn't match what I have. So our habitat is actually Rocky Limestone Hill. And then we have some description. So the description in this label actually came before the locality string. Disc deep yellow. And that's it.
Um, I mentioned this long form. Mm-hmm. Thanks, Linda Joe. Yeah, I mentioned this long form um, and how for most of these records, you will only need to enter into fields that are on this page right here. There's some examples where you may have on the label some associated species. Um, you have the option of having that in the habitat information. You also, if you feel comfortable, if you click the long form, there is actually a separate field for associated taxa. So here is a space where you can start typing in scientific names and you'll see a list, a drop down list that comes up um, and you can start selecting um, any that show up on your label. So they can go into this field. However, if you are overwhelmed with what this long form looks like, you can include associates in the habitat information. And that's just fine with us. Um, you'll also, again, you know, if you want to, if you feel comfortable with long form, um, we're not requiring that we have um, the determiner information on here. But again, this is information that you could enter if you feel comfortable. So the person who identified this most recently was Todd F. Stussy in 1968. He's who identified this species, this specimen. So you could put that in here and the date, 1968. Um, so again, this is not necessary and only if you feel comfortable um, looking at this, this page with a lot more information. I'm gonna save edits. We're really getting down. We got some people already practicing, which is awesome. I know for sure some associated species will show up on car specimen. Let's see if we can find any of his. Here we go. This should be a good example. Um, Bill Carr's labels are usually a little bit more involved. It might not be associated species on here. And it looks like associated collectors were also included. So that might also be a field where um, the previous um, transcriber may have missed associated collectors. So just confirm that any other names, associates on the label is also an associated collector. So it looks like they did that. Right, but this one has more, a little bit more information regardless. So let's start typing in the locality. Um, looks like this starts a little bit halfway through this paragraph. Air miles southeast, and yay for us, we have some um, a duplicate somewhere. This looks like it's matching exactly what we've got here, and it even has the correct coordinates. It carried over elevation, so this one was great. Um, Locally frequent, that is one of those uh, words or phrases that we're going to put in notes. So we'll keep that in notes. Um, and then habitat starts in mixed early successional vegetation on silt or silt loam on level upland. And that is about it. And then lastly, the remaining information is some plant descriptions. So shrub forming rounded mounds, four to five feet tall and almost twice as wide. Flowers not seen. Okay. And I think that's it for this one. And are there any more car? Yeah, there's a few more. Let's see if any of these have associated species. Ooh, here we go. This is a long one. This will probably be our last one. It'll take a few minutes. Um, but again, if this is, you know, one that you come up to and you just, it's a little overwhelming, it's super long, you don't want to do it, these will all be transcribed eventually. So you can definitely skip this if you aren't feeling um, confident in transcribing it. 
So for this example, I think Rio Grande Delta is part of our loca locality. Um, again, lucky us. Someone's already transcribed a duplicate of this specimen. And it looks to be correct to me. It's looking like it's matching what I'm seeing on my label. So I'm going to click it. And you'll notice that, you know, just like how we can make our image box bigger, we can make our locality box bigger to be able to see the whole thing if you need to. Um, and I'm going to use the F button to insert this information, um, the coordinates, because I got a decimal Latin long, but I don't see any verbatim coordinates right here. It wasn't in the locality, and I want to make sure that this is actually correct. Um, and if it is, this won't change. If it's not, you'll see the numbers update. Right, 97, 34.66. Okay, so it actually added on a few more numbers, but it, for the most part, was correct. <laughs> And then we're just missing some elevation. So that one didn't carry across. And you'll see that it converts it automatically to meters. So you'll see different numbers here if you're entering in feet. But if your label has meters, it should end up being the same. Common is some notes. And then it goes into habitat in subtropical thorn woodland. From level upland of, hmm, could put Rio Grande Delta. I could just put Delta. I could put, um, you know, this kind of defines like what Delta kind of Delta it is. Um, that is fine to keep there. Um, I'd say. And then here, this long list <laughs> of all the associates um, with this, this species. So here is where you have the option to just put it, put this in the habitat information. So I could start typing, woody associates include all of this list. It's a long list. Um, for this case, there's so many, and I know that in this field, we'll have a drop down list, and it might save me a little bit of typing. Um, so we can start putting those in here. Um, all right, let's see. Um, you'll notice, so I just typed in. I'll zoom in a little. This is as far as I can zoom in. Um, Amaris madrens, madrensis, and then it says a dot texana. Um, when you see that, the a dot is just shorthand for whatever genus just came before that. And you'll know that it's correct because as I start typing it, yep, there was an a texana. <laughs> Again, here's another box I can make a little bit bigger if I needed to. Um, you may see SP dot either, you know, in this field, obviously. Um, but you could just see a genus with SP dot you won't ever see sp dot in the scientific name. That's just referring to any, to, you know, the collector knew it was in this group, this genus. However, they weren't able to identify it down to that species level. Um, so you wouldn't have to put sp dot um, and just put the genus. It's just a little bit more, I mean, you won't come across too many examples like this, thankfully. 
Um, but since we're on it, I'm just going to finish it out. Um, and we're getting close to our time. Let's see if I can finish it <laughs> by the hour. Um, I guess in the meantime, let me just, if you haven't already, we, um, you know, some of you are new, some of you may have done any of our notes from nature or other, you know, virtual projects in the past. Um, in 2020, we started having regular Zoom meetings for armchair botanist uh, volunteers. Um, and we've changed the, you know, number of times we met, we've changed the day of the week we've met, um, and kind of the format. So this year, we'd really love some feedback on what you guys want to see from these Zoom meetings um, going forward this year. So if you want to fill out that survey, it would really help us out as we um, figure out what Armchair Botanist looks like for those meetings this year. Mm -hmm. I know these ones in Notes from Nature, people were definitely like, eh, someone else will get to it. This is such a, taking such a long time. And I totally get that. Mm -hmm. Montana, we're getting there. Ashley, may I interrupt? Of course. Um, is there anybody who is who will, if we are blatantly making stupid mistakes, that will contact us and? kindly educate us <laughs> yeah of course that, that bothers me you know <laughs> that I don't want to be wasting your time no so let me show you I'll pop over I swear I'll finish that um I'll show you what it looks like on my end um so once you've com completed a transcription this is what I see with my admin permission. So I have a list of people that have transcribed in the project and then there's a column for pending review. So these are ones that folks have already uh, transcribed and I need to review them. And then everything on the approved has already been approved by me. I've gone through it. So um, Linda Joe, it looks like you did good. I approved the ones that you've done so far. Let's look at that. Um, what I look for, you know, it gives me again, another table. Some of the things that I will look for whenever you're, whenever they're pending review, I'll look at the processing status. So since I've already reviewed them, I've changed it, but I'll look for any that say expert required. So those are ones that I know for sure someone needed help with. Um, and then I'll look at some of these columns. So locality, let's say that there's not a locality in there. That would be a red flag for me. Um, you know, either there really was no locality or it was missed. Um, so I guess I didn't mention that we'd love for there to always be something in locality. Um, so let's say on the label and maybe I've actually selected one eh, it's in Lubbock in Lubbock County um so for this I would just put Lubbock but let's say it didn't specify the city and we just got county putting something in the locality field such as no additional locality information on the sheet uh something along the lines of that um is helpful to me at least when I'm reviewing um, that way I know that, like I said, that they're really, you, you have checked, you noticed there was no additional, like no other locality information beyond the county. Um, and that's why you put it in there. Um, that's always really helpful because I do look for any empty locality fields. Um, or I may look um, in the habitat fields, I might look for names of places to make sure that they're also in locality, like we talked about. Um, 
So those are some of the things that I'll look for. But I mean, you've done so many already. I obviously can't look at every single one. I really am just doing some spot checking and seeing if there's anything super obvious that looks a little bit off. Um, but absolutely, if I ended up seeing, you know, a consistent um, way that you were transcribing something incorrectly, I'll absolutely reach out to you and kindly let you know um, how to fix it. <laughs> but I won't Thank be, you. <laughs> but Thank we're, you. yeah, of course, but we are grateful for, you know, any number of specimens you guys can transcribe for us. You know, we don't require a certain amount to be transcribed or that you, um, transcribe for a certain amount of time or anything like that. Do make sure that you're keeping track of the time yourself so that you can report it in Vlogistics. So you're getting credit, um, volunteer hour credit, whether that be for us um, as a Fort Worth Botanic Garden Brit volunteer, or um, I know some of you are master naturalists or gardeners, if you're able to get credit for working on these specimens and getting volunteer hours for that, um, you can uh, make sure that you log that information as well. So you can get credit for the time that you're helping us. Um, and I'm a little bit over the hour, but um, I really appreciate you guys spending your Saturday morning um, learning about this. And please feel free to, you know, email me, put my email again in here. I'm going to, on our armchair botanist page, if you want to bookmark it, I'll send this as well in the chat. Um, the recorded training session, and I guess I can stop recording. 